Justin and I um, were friends from the get-go. Even as kids, he could find the silver lion to any cloud. Just always positive, always happy, always driven just to enjoy life. I remember when he told me on the phone that he had started to notice a lot of weakness in his hands. I thought, okay, his, his hands are his lifeblood. This is his career. I wasn't prepared for the first time I saw him after his hands had really started to decline when, uh, when he asked me to help feed him. Having to hold the glass with two hands, needing a straw because he couldn't navigate holding the cup. And then now it's his wife or I or his kids have to hold the cup for him. It was heavy, it was hard to see that, that change. I thought over and over, why not me, you know? Because in a second, I would trade places in a second. I could see that dark, deep hole that you can go down. And I was on the edge of that. But then, life is too short to sit around and complain. And life is too short to go down that deep, dark hole. Hey, buddy. Hey. How's it going, man? How's it going? Good. Aw. Oh. Thanks, buddy. You too, man. Well, I wasn't really looking for uh, the Camino. It kind of found me. I was watching PBS, and on came Rick Steves, and he was doing a thing on Spain. talking about the Camino, and I was like, what's that? I never heard of it, never heard of it at all. Later, I turned to my wife and I just said, man, that'd be something that would be crazy to do. I wonder if I could do that in my wheelchair. My immediate thought was, like, Pat and I should do this together. We were sitting in his, his living room, and uh, he asked me, go across uh, 500 miles in northern Spain with me? And I said, no, I'll push you. Justin, and this is my BFF forever. How you guys doing? Patrick. Uh, we, ha we have literally known each other our entire lives. We were born just over 36 hours apart in the same hospital, grew up in the same town, went to the same school, traveled together, went to church together. Uh, man, just lived life, seen its ups and downs, and uh, navigated life's many challenges together. 
So speaking of challenges, I want to ask you a question. Have any of you ever had a challenge that's so great that you knew there was no way you could accomplish it on your own? The, the kind of task that pushes you to the limits of who you are. And the very limitations that you possess are what's going to hide success from you. So speaking of limitations, we all have them. If we're honest with ourselves, we all have limitations. Justin's happen to be physical. But there's one thing that I've learned as I've been given the luxury of walking this path of life with Justin is that he's not an individual who is defined by his limitations. He is defined by what he is able to accomplish in spite of those limitations. Now granted, some of those successes require the strength of others. But I would argue that if every one of us are honest with ourselves, a lot of the successes that we achieve in life can be attributed to the fact that someone came alongside of us and pushed us when we needed it. And so we'd like to kind of unpack this for you, uh, how impact or how community has uh, not only just personally impacted us, but how it could be important for you uh, as we move forward. And so, but before we do that, I want to kind of get you up to speed on what we actually did this past summer. And so here's a map of, uh, nor of northern Spain. Uh, we successfully completed in 34 days the, uh, the Camino de Santiago. It's an ancient pilgrimage. It's been around for quite some time, over a thousand years plus, if not more. Uh, many people do it for many different reasons, religious, physical, just a challenge. Um, and I was just like, hey, I'll give it a shot. And I took a very specialized wheelchair. So I didn't take this wheelchair. I took a, I call it the, a three-wheeled baby jogger on steroids. That's basically <laughs> what I saw. So you'll see some pictures of it in a minute. Uh, but we basically, we, we took what's called the French route. Uh, it's 500, it starts just over the French-Spanish border. And we go across the Pyrenees mountain range and traverse 800 kilometers or just shy of 500 miles uh, going west. And we end in the city of Santiago de Compostela. There's a cathedral that, you, uh, that we ended at. And so uh, it was quite a crazy adventure, as you might, advent, uh, might imagine. And we're going to take you to day one. Day one is by far the most difficult thing I think we've ever done in our entire lives. No we crossed the Pyrenees mountain range in a wheelchair. Uh, and we'll show you some, here's some photos. So we took um, our buddy Ted with us. He's the guy out front in this one. And we're at the base of the mountain. Uh, we started in a little village called St. Jean Pied de Port. And as we're climbing, it goes straight up straight up for miles and miles and miles and miles. And here's Patrick about to vomit. <laughs> Three miles in. Three miles up. <laughs> Not good. Still at 10 miles that day. We'd come around the corner and there'd be eight to 10 inches of mud for hundreds of yards with cliffs on one side, mountain on the other. Um, and there was no option. We had to go through it. And so as we're climbing and climbing, it the, tr the train was absolutely insane. And it was straight up all day. <laughs> I can't even, so it's like, I mean, you can't, you can barely see it. Ted's like about to heave over in the back right there. So as you go to the, go to the next slide, please. This is us finally summiting. Took us t 10 hours to finally summit that day. Uh, there's us looking into Spain. We actually crossed the French and Spanish border. 34 days left we had, and we realized <laughs> One thing, that you can pretty much do anything for a day. <laughs> but we knew that we, could, we, we needed help. It was very apparent. And so Patrick's going to talk to you about uh, day two and what happened to us next. So you think about that phrase, you can do anything for a day. Uh, it implies that hmm, maybe you can't keep doing it. Well, we figured that out on day two which is pretty early in a journey to figure out that, holy crap, we need some help. So uh, I don't want to say that we were cocky, but we were feeling really confident because we just come over the Pyrenees. So can I give you perspective? To our knowledge, Justin's the first person to conquer that mountain range on that specific path in a wheelchair. People cut through it on roads. People take the, what's called the bike path. And a lot of people have done that in wheelchairs, but uh, not over the top, the Napoleon route. And so we're, we're in day two. We're about four miles or so into it, and uh, this happens. That is supposed to be attached to the chair. <laughs> so what was, 
what was interesting about this is Ted's, Ted's uh, in, uh, behind Justin, pushing him. I'm out front kind of scoping things out. We're in an area where there's some trees. We've crossed one river already. We're two miles from the nearest town. And it's I turned to, rain. it's pouring rain, yeah. I turned to Ted, I'm like, yeah. dude, if we can do the Pyrenees, we got this. Two minutes later, all I hear is, Whoa! and I look back, and Justin has just lurched forward in his chair, the nose is in the dirt, and the wheels separated from the chair. All right. But what was cool about this experience is that the people in that area surrounded us. People, we had, we had no idea who they were. They got us to shelter. They got us food. They got us water. They helped us navigate the, the, the country, so we got to Pamplona, and here we are in a medical supply store, and this gentleman that is uh, helping us happened to be the boyfriend of the girl who ran the counter at the medical supply store. Turns out he had an interest in welding. <laughs> Thus began the game of the six degrees of the aluminum welder in Pamplona. Which is like, which is like a needle in the haystack, yeah. by the way. But yeah. through what we believe to be divine uh, intervention, 48 hours after we broke the wheel, and I say we because it was a collective effort, <laughs> we're back on the road headed westward to Santiago. And this was just the tip of the iceberg of what we were going to experience as this trip continued to unfold. And so now we're going to go ahead and skip to day 28. <laughs> to give you two, some perspective, we had already been on the road for three weeks, very road weary, very tired. Patrick's body start to get, starting to give out, um, magic pushing 250 pounds. I'm not 250 pounds, but with the chair and me and the gear, 250 pounds. Um, and we were coming up yet uh, against another mountain range. We had already crossed two, two mountain ranges, believe it or not, plus 150 miles through what's called the Meseta. It's the, it's the across northern Spain. It's like the desert. It's more or less like Kansas, just miles and miles and miles of wheat fields. And so now we're, now we're coming into the last province called Galicia. And there's a mountain range we're coming up, our last one, it's called Osobrero. And many people told us Go around, you can't make it, it's too steep. We've heard this song and dance before because people told us that before we went over the Pyrenees. So we said, well, we're gonna take a look at it. And you know, both Patrick and I being kind of men of faith, we met two pilgrims. Uh, we kind of feel like it's maybe divine intervention, but we met two pilgrims in a cathedral in Burgos. And their name was uh, Joe and Richard, and they said, hey, uh, what do you guys, you guys need some help? And we said, yeah, we're going to try to go over this pass called Osobrero. And they said, all right, we're going to wait at the base of, this, of the mountain. Uh, we'll meet you there. So we coordinate everything. Okay, now we're skipping ahead. Now we're meeting there en route. And unbeknownst to us, this is where the power of community really tra um, was just transparent for us. It just showed its just shown its light for us. By the time we arrived at the base of that mountain, that village, there were 12 people waiting for us. Just through people walking by and saying, hey, what are you guys doing here? And they said, we're waiting for Justin. He's in a wheelchair. We want to get him over this fountain pass. And they said, all right, we'll stop. And so I'm going to show you a rock clip. So go ahead and get that rock cl clip uh, queued up, please. And this, I'm going to walk you through what actually happened for that day. So go ahead and play the clip, please. And so here we are. Um, we're start we just left the village. There's 12 of us, and we're at the trailhead. The trailhead split between a road and, a, and the trail, and they, everyone turned around and said, hey, Justin, what do you want to do? And I said, well, let's take the trail. Life's never easy. Let's make it happen. And so uh, off we go down the trail. Almost immediately, we come around the corner, and it is straight up. So steep that just even on foot, it's very difficult to uh, navigate. So I was carried up this mountain by these people. It took six people to carry me. And I describe this as the most beautiful human symphony. I'm at the epicenter of all of it. This common objective to get me up to the top of this mountain where people were coming around me, picking up and picking me up and carrying me. And as somebody else got tired, they would drop out and somebody else would come in. And as I'm getting pushed, pulled, and dragged up this mountain, other people, other pilgrims that were coming by were coming in. And I would turn around and there would be somebody new. And as we get closer to the top, I'm escorted by the police. <laughs> After about 10 hours, here we are at the final summit for that day, 17 people in total from countries all around the world 
Uh, some people spoke English, some people didn't. And it's very difficult for me to articulate what that means. Um, I may never wrap my head around it. I may never un fully understand it. Um, who knows why these people did what they did to help me. But I do know this. I might not be able to walk. I might not be able to use my hands and feed myself. I might not be able to bathe or get my clothes on by myself. I might not be able to hold my children or even my wife's hand as I walk down the beach. But through the power of community, I climbed mountains. And I believe, I think we believe, that these people were selfless. They did it because of joy. They did it because of love. They did it because they had a deep desire for us to succeed. It's the power of community. It can move you and take you in places you've never been. So mountains, every life has them. Every life has mountains they gotta overcome. Every life has broken wheels. Every life has rivers to cross. Adversity is all around us. And some lives triumph in the face of that adversity and some lives don't. But I would argue that there's one common theme that we can see in the lives that triumph consistently. And that is that there are people who see needs. They see someone who needs hands, who needs feet, who needs power, love, strength, whatever it may be. And they make the conscious decision to be that thing of need for a moment, for a day, for a lifetime. I've had the absolute joy of Justin in my life since day one. And he has pushed, pulled, and drugged me over my mountains time and time again. Every one of us has people in our lives who have pushed, pulled, and drug us over our mountains at some point in time. And every one of us has people in our lives who are desperate for hope, who are desperate for someone to come along and push them up to face their mountains, over the precipice of their mountains, push them forward in life, push them beyond their limitations. So I want to close with a question. Who are you going to push? Thank you. Thank you.